is J.I. Packer? Put simply, in the last half of the 20th century and early part of our own century, J.I. Packer has been one of the foremost influences among evangelical Christians. His lengthy career has spanned six decades, first in England alongside the likes of Martin Lloyd-Jones and John Stott, then in Canada at Regent College, and finally in the United States through his voluminous writings. There's a mystery about how a mere professor could achieve the kind of influence that Packer has achieved. He never filled a high visibility pulpit as a regular position. He always taught at small evangelical colleges and seminaries. He became famous on the strength of his books. His books cover the basics of Christian belief and are filled with practical wisdom about how to live the Christian life to the glory of God. So who is J.I. Packer? To answer this question, we might ask what he has made the focus of his ministry. The title of a book written in his honor sounds the right note, Doing Theology for the People of God. G.K. Chesterton began his autobiography by saying that he was assured by competent folk that he was born in a certain place at a certain time. Like G.K. Chesterton, I believe that I was born. I have often been told I was. I was brought up in a lower middle class home in Gloucester City, England. I had an ordinary upbringing and thought of myself as a very ordinary person right through my youth. My home was solid, the atmosphere was friendly and affectionate, no kind of uh, insecurity. We were a church-going family, that's true, but church attendance was part of the family routine. We did it without thinking or talking about it. I can't honestly say that the home had very much that was positively Christian in it, except parental affection, parental stability, and parental concern that uh, I and my sister, the two children, uh, should have a fair crack of the whip educationally and then in terms of whatever profession we chose. I went to ordinary schools, infant school, junior school, and then a grammar school. I was a fairly, um, how can I say it, a, a fairly sharp student, and I did well at school and eventually got myself uh, a scholarship to Oxford. But I found it pleasant to work. I always enjoyed reading and learning things. For a number of reasons, I was not a, not a sportsman. My inclinations never would have taken me that way, and uh, I had an accident early in life. When I was seven years old, I was chased out into the street by a fellow classmate at the junior school that I was attending, and came into violent collision with a truck. The effect was to knock in um, part of my skull in the way that the top of an eggshell is knocked in when you hit it with an egg spoon. And the bits of broken bone had to be removed in the providence of God there was a very skilled brain surgeon at our local hospital. He had done training at Vienna, which was the number one world center of brain surgery at that time. He did a very skillful job. When, when I went back to school, well, I was uh, obliged to wear an aluminum plate over the hole 
where the bone had been taken out, and the effect was uh, to make me feel like a speckled bird. And at the age of 15, I think, um, I went on strike and refused to wear it anymore. My school days otherwise were fairly straightforward. I was a bookish boy. Um, I loved reading. I began to write in imitation of the stuff I was reading. On my 11th birthday, I had dropped broad hints that what I hoped for was a full-size bicycle. Um, on my birthday morn on the birthday morning, however, what I found waiting for me was an old typewriter. The gift of the typewriter was almost prophetic. My parents foresaw, and I think that this was brilliant parenting on their, on, on their part, they foresaw that um, I would have enormous fulfillment out of doing things with a typewriter, writing this, writing that, whatever. It was, in fact, the best present that I ever had as a boy. And uh, it continued with me uh, for, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years before it finally lost its, um, its power to function. And I've always had a typewriter and day by day been using it ever since. So the effect of that was to confirm that in some sense or other, I was going to be a writer. All my writing and all my ministry has been focused on feeding. Uh, any writing and ministry that remains in the future uh, will have the same focus. Packer is, above all else, a communicator. As an author, he has made it a priority to write for the common person. His signature book, entitled Knowing God, which has sold nearly two million copies, was not drafted as a bestseller. It grew out of a series of articles for a small religious magazine. Packer can do specialized scholarly writing of the highest order but he deliberately writes in a simplified style that the ordinary Christian can understand. That does not mean that the thinking in Packer's books and articles is simple. What he writes is based on very sophisticated thinking, but he writes books and essays as a hymn writer writes poetry under vows of renunciation, that is, deliberately controlling the amount of visible scholarship and technical language. But foundational to Packer's prolific literary career has been his persistent love of books and reading. In this, Packer's life is truly countercultural today. In an age of disposable communication, Packer's emphasis on the written word reminds us that Christianity is, at its heart, a religion of the book. Right from the start of my Christian life, that is, from the time of my conversion at age 18, the Bible has been central in my devotion, in my understanding of the faith, and as I've grown older, uh, in the writing that I've done, I've produced, I suppose, half a dozen different books seeking one way or another to vindicate the truth, the trustworthiness, the life-giving quality of Holy Scripture. People wonder in these days whether reading is important in anybody's life, and particularly whether Christian reading is important in the Christian life. I think that that uncertainty is one of the oddities of our time and I hope we shall very soon outgrow it. Any reading that makes you think about the subject matter and the truth of what's being affirmed or denied and that leaves you clearer in your own mind about it is, is beneficial reading. I hope myself that the age of the book 
is not coming to an end as um, a number of modern prophets have uh, said they think it is. I write books in the hope that people will read them and benefit by them. And I continue to read books with the same goal. Among the theologians that I've read and profited from ha um, have been John Calvin and his institutes, uh, John Owen, the Puritan, who wrote on a number of fundamental Christian themes masterfully in every case, and I learned a great deal from him. Richard Baxter, another Puritan, from whom I learned most of what I feel I know about the commitment of a pastor to his people. Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress is a book that I reread every year, and I hope that uh, nobody will tell me that it's not a theological book, because it is, at a very, a very deep and insightful level. There was an Anglican bishop named Ryle, first bishop of Liverpool, England, in the last 20 years of the 19th century, who wrote a great book with the one word title, Holiness. That book is one that I very much appreciated over the years and gone back to on many different occasions. All these books are in the historic reformational tradition and that's where most of the influences that uh, my reading has brought to bear on me have come from. And I don't apologize for that. Truth is truth. And uh, the, chrono the chronology of it, whether it's truth that was put into print 50 years ago or 500, is a secondary matter. I want reading to remain part of our culture and I think that we shall lose far more than we gain if we abandon the reading of books for the picking up of information by any other means whatsoever. In the history of Christendom, very few academicians have devoted as much time to church matters as Packer has. He has modeled devotion to the Bible as the sure and infallible Word of God, the need for Christians to live holy lives, and the importance of steadfastly refusing to accommodate the plain teaching of the Bible to current cultural trends. But the biggest lesson that we can learn from Packer's life is the lesson of being a faithful steward in the tasks that God places before us. Packer never set out to make a splash. He never tried to gather a following. He simply cultivated his garden and left the results to God. It is a model that we can all strive to imitate. When I look back on the productions that uh, I've had a part in, uh, uh, during the course of my life. The English Standard Version of the Bible, the ESV, stands out as perhaps the most valuable thing that I've ever been involved in. We didn't have a translation that was um, literal in the sense that it labored all the time to be transparent to the word sequence and sentence structure of the original Hebrew and Greek so that it would get the reader as close to the original wording as any translation could. We needed a translation that was viable for all ages and all levels of study. We needed a translation that uh, could be memorized relatively easily, as the Bible has been memorized from other translations in the past. We needed a Bible that would read well in the pulpit. We needed a Bible that would be clear for the exposition 
from the pulpit that faithful pastors would give. We needed a Bible that would be free from cultural bias of any sort. We needed a translation that, as far as possible, didn't tip its hand or its hat in the direction of any of the contemporary areas of debate. As far as possible, then, it would be transcultural in the sense that it simply registered in translation what was there in the original and stopped at that point. And it seems to me that we who worked on the English Standard Version had considerable success, by God's mercy, at all these points. And I shall continue to see this as the most important bit of service to the church that uh, I've been involved in in the whole of my working life. As I look back on the life that I've lived, I would like to be remembered as a voice, a voice that focused on the authority of the Bible, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wonder of his substitutionary sacrifice in atonement for our sins. I would like to be remembered as a voice calling Christian people to holiness and challenging lapses in Christian moral standards. I should like to be remembered as someone who was always courteous in controversy, but without compromise. I ask you to thank God with me for the way that he's led me, and I wish, hope, pray that you will enjoy the same clear leading from him and the same help in doing the tasks that he sets you that I have enjoyed. And if your joy matches my joy as we continue in our Christian lives, well, you will be blessed indeed.